I'm turning your King James Bible to John chapter 6. I'm going to start a do a study today on the flesh and the blood of the King Jesus version. You've been following along with this series of videos. Uh, you know where this whole thing is heading. I'm trying to prove the importance of our King James Bible. Um, King James Version is a nickname. So if it can be nicknamed the King James Version, I can also nickname it the King Jesus Version because it's about Jesus. This book is Jesus Christ on paper. It's a story of his life. It's a story of who he is. So John chapter 6 verse 1. I'm going to go through this passage here, John chapter 6, and we're going to see some really interesting tie-ins with what exactly the flesh and the blood are. Uh, if you know this story, um, many of his disciples left Jesus after he came out and was saying these things in John chapter 6. And the Roman Catholics get all messed up on this whole thing. They think he was talking about some kind of Eucharistic thing and transubstantiation where he turns regular you know, bread and wine into his physical flesh and, and blood. And you're supposed to eat that. And if you do, then you violate Scripture, which is interesting. Um, that's not what it's about. And I'm going to show you the true interpretation of John chapter 6 in this study. Very detailed, very interesting study. John chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Um, Whence shall we buy bread? Huh. To feed these people. Uh, Proverbs chapter 23. What's he talking about here? In other words, he's not talking about physical bread. He's speaking symbolically. Proverbs 23 and verse 23. Proverbs 23, verse 23. Buy the truth hmm, and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Buy the truth and sell it not. What is the truth? Go to John 17, verse 17. John chapter 17, verse 17. The Bible says here, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word is truth. So what was Jesus trying to say there? Where can we buy bread? Buy the truth. What is the truth? The word of God rather interesting there. Now let's go back to John chapter 6 and verse 7. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may, be, may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was a much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Huh, make the men sit down. There was a lot of grass. There was much grass in the place. You say, okay, what's the significance there? 1 Peter chapter 1. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. See a very interesting little thing tying this together. First Peter chapter one. Verse twenty four and twenty five. For all flesh is as grass. A lot of men, there's much grass there. And all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So Jesus symbolically is saying, by the truth, by the word here. The word is what is needed by the grass, the flesh. 
the flesh is going to perish. It's going to go away. The word endures forever. Kind of an interesting thing here. Now let's go back to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 11 through 14. If you want to get some kind of a bookmark or something too, that would just keep it in John chapter 6. We're going to be going other places in the Bible, but keep coming back to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 11 through 14. Let's read that. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, his he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Hmm. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Um, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet, that should come into the world. All right. Now notice a couple things here. Um, first and foremost, Jesus gives the bread, which is symbolic of the word, to, to his disciples, and they distribute it to the multitudes. Hmm, is not what we're supposed to do. God gives us his word, and we're supposed to distribute this bread to the multitudes. We're his disciples. Now, he had his unique, you know, 12 disciples there, certainly. But we are also his disciples. And we should be distributing his word to the multitudes. Um... 2 Peter chapter 1. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, we'll start in verse 19. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Through 21. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy, prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Holy men of God spake. The disciples distributed the bread the word of God, they distributed it to the people. Hmm. Notice also there in John chapter 6, it talked about the fragments of the bread needed to be gathered up so that nothing would be lost. Interesting, because what is the New Testament? Many people don't even realize this. What is the New Testament? It's fragments that are put together. Huh. Um, the King James Bible, you know, you say, well, what if we had the original autographs? If you had the original autographs and they were still readable, which they wouldn't be after, you know, nearly 2,000 years, if you had the original autographs, they would be fragments, just pieces. The Greek manuscripts, the extant Greek manuscripts, many of them are just little pieces here and there of some things and whatever else, and they have to kind of weigh it out and, okay, the received text, the, the vast majority of the manuscripts line up and say this, and then there's a minority of it, less than 1% of extant Greek manuscripts kind of go with the, what would be called the Alexandrian style reading or whatever else, the minority text. Okay, very interesting. It's fragments of bread. Huh. And yet we have this wonderful text right here, this King James Bible. And it's the whole thing. Hmm. Why? Well, because some disciples down through the centuries made sure to gather up the fragments so that nothing would be lost. You see? Matthew chapter 24. Go to Matthew chapter 24. It's an amazing book when you just believe it. But that's the condition. If you don't believe this book, it's not amazing. It's just a man-made book and you can just kind of eh, you know, pay attention to certain parts and eh, whatever. Just ignore the rest. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. <clears throat> Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Why? Because God has holy men in every age that can gather up the fragments so that nothing is lost. Hmm. That's why. 
John chapter 6. And you start to read the Bible, you know, and after a while you kind of realize that I think the written Word of God is very important to him. I've stressed that thing so many times over the years, and yet some people still don't get it. You know, it's amazing to me. <clears throat> John chapter 6, verse 15 down through 27. Okay, verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him king, to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down in under the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he said unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one wherein, wherein to his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place, where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Hmm. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat, that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Oh boy. Bread, meat, and then there's a sealing. Notice that. He's sealed. What's that about? Revelation chapter 5. I covered this in the last study, but we'll go through this again. Revelation chapter 5. Verses 1 through 5. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Jesus Christ is sealed, but he can open those seals. The word of God is sealed, but the Lord can open the seals. Hmm. Go back to John chapter 6. Back to John chapter 6. We'll go through more of this amazing passage and see what it's talking about here. John chapter 6, verse 28. Through 32. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the, in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Manna, bread from heaven, as it is written. Hmm. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Huh. Isn't that interesting? The true bread from heaven is now there. What do you think the Lord's talking about? If you paid attention to the other two studies in this series, you know the importance of this book right here. This is the Word of God. This book is compared to bread. 
That's the true bread from heaven. But Jesus Christ is referring to it like it's himself. Hmm. But let's go back and read this account here of what Moses did. Exodus chapter 16. The account of the manna coming down from heaven. This is some really interesting stuff. Exodus 16. Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came under the wilderness of Sin, <laughs> uh, which is before or between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after the departing out of the land of Egypt. Um, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Kind of an interesting uh, thing there. The children of Israel murmured while they were in the wilderness of sin. Uh, that's pretty telling, I would say, right there. But why did they murmur? Verse 3. Exodus chapter 16, verse 3. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Um, they were lusting after Egyptian bread. Hmm. Where did the new versions come from again? Uh, ultimately going back to Alexandria, Egypt, and the corrupted manuscripts that began there with Origen and a lot of the other philosophers that the Catholic Church calls church fathers. Uh, and the Gnostics and all the other things that were there, the philosophers. Um, hmm. We want the bread from Egypt. A lot of modern professing Christians want the bread from Egypt as well. But I'm not talking about bread that you eat with your mouth. I'm talking about the Word of God. Hmm. Let's continue. Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they walk, whether they uh, will walk in my law or no. Hum, that's pretty interesting. Bread from heaven, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law. Huh. Uh, what did the Lord say to his disciple there, Philip, I think it was, about the feeding of the 5,000? This he did, you know, where are we going to buy bread? This he did to prove him. Are you going to walk in my law or no? Interesting. Let me show you another interesting verse here. Psalm 119. We'll come back here to Exodus chapter 16. But uh, go to Psalm 119. Uh, Psalm 119 verse 97. You'll see an interesting thing here. Psalm 119, verse 97 through 104. O oh, how love I thy law! It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from more from every evil way that it that I may might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Remember that. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. I hate every false version. <laughs> Go back to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, verse 5 through 12. Remember the honey thing about the Word of God. We'll get back to that in this passage throughout this chapter, I'm saying. Exodus 16, verses 5 through 12. And it shall come to pass 
uh, that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Um, and Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel at even, Then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall eat you, or shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full. Flesh and bread. Hmm. Tie in there. Two words used interchangeably. For that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur, murmur against him. And what are you, what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. Hmm. Flesh and bread to eat. I wonder if there's a tie in there. Um, Exodus 16, verse 13 down through verse 31. We'll read that. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoar frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. That bread that Moses came down from heaven. And they said, Moses gave it to us to eat. The Lord gave it to him to eat, but it wasn't the true bread that came later on with Jesus Christ. Um, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, and omer for every man. According to the number of your persons, take ye every man for them which are in the tents. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some less. And when they had, and when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. Some New Testament times there we won't get into. Verse 19, And Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, on the, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and see that ye will seethe. And that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning, as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm there, therein. And Moses said, Eat this today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not f uh, find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? <laughs> See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Um, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Again, some real you know, spiritual tie-ins there um, towards the thousand-year kingdom, the millennial kingdom that Jesus Christ will rule and reign from. But look at verse 31. Remember we read in, in uh, Psalm 119 about the word of God being like honey. Look at this, verse 31. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Hmm. An interesting thing there, for sure. Wafers made with honey. Kind of an interesting thing. Let me just flip my page here on my notes. Revelation chapter 10. Go to Revelation chapter 10. Uh, 
Revelation chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Ha! Huh. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Um... God's word tastes like honey. It's sweet, but there's a bitterness to it as well. Um, there are times that you will realize that uh, there are certain promises and certain prophecies you know, written in the word of God, and it's a sweet thing to know the truth, but it can be rather bitter at times to realize the world's not going to get better. If you know what I mean. John chapter 6. We'll go back to John chapter 6 now. So now that we have established what the manna was all about, that, that was a type of the Word of God in the Old Testament, but now the true manna has come down from heaven, which is a reference to Jesus Christ. Now we'll go back to John chapter 6 and read verse 33 down to verse 40. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. They're not getting it. Um, they don't understand what he's saying. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, lest ye also have seen me, and believe not. And that the Father giveth me, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the, will, the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, and should raise it up again at the last day. Um, and this is the will of him that, that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son, and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So there you have Jesus the Word gives eternal life when you believe what is written. <laughs> Again, the whole point of this series of studies is to get people to put their faith in what's written and understand that that's what it's really all about. But look at this uh, great example of naturalistic textual criticism coming up here in the next verse, verse 41 and 42. The Jews then murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Uh, he's just a man. He's not God. Well, you know what? That's the same thing people are saying when they say this is just a man-made book. It's not, a, it's not God's perfect word. It's just a translation. You're saying the same thing. But look at what Jesus responds. Verse 43. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. <laughs> Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Uh, that's what these guys do when they reject the word of God. But isn't it interesting that that's exactly what the children of Israel did back in the Old Testament? They came along and they started to murmur against the Lord. Oh, we need the, the bread of Egypt. We're not satisfied to be out here in the wilderness. And all that we have is this word, this bread that comes down from heaven. There's a lot of people that are out in the wilderness of sin and they're not satisfied with the uh, bread which comes down from heaven either. Hmm. Verse 44, John chapter 6, verse 44 through 47. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and, there, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. It's an interesting thing because um, 
everlasting life, it's ultimately up to God who gets it. That's why you have to contact Him when you want to be saved. You don't just say, I'm going to mentally think myself to be saved. No, you actually have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Ask God to save you. All right? Your salvation is based on what is written, first and foremost, but secondly, on God's decision. If you don't believe this word, how on earth is God going to even be able to grant you your request? You have to believe what's written, okay, in order to be saved. I would think that that would be fairly simple, but there's people that reject that, which is amazing to me. John chapter 6, verse 48 through 52. I am that bread of life. He says it again. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Well, obviously, Jesus is not talking about physical flesh. He's not saying, come on over here and take a bite of me. Um, Jesus is not physically a loaf of bread walking around. All right? He's speaking in a symbolic type of a way, and they're not getting it. They're not understanding. Look at verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He adds something else to it now. It's not just eating the flesh, it's also drinking the blood. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Uh, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. Um, he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Okay? Um, Jesus was not talking about eating his physical flesh and blood, but rather believing the Old and New Testament, as I've been saying throughout all these studies. Oh, I can be saved and just reject this book here. No, you can't. No, you cannot. You have to be able to eat the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Well, what is that? You're consuming the Word. You see? You see how it all works there? Obviously, Jesus was not talking in a, in a figure or a, in a in a literal, physical way. You can't just come up and bite him and drink his blood and, and there you get eternal life. That's not what he's talking about. He says, oh, well, it's a, the communion thing. It's communion. It's not talking about communion in the passage. How do you know? Verse 57, As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. It's talking about spiritual fellowship. It is not talking about some kind of a communion transubstantiation service. That's where the Catholics get really mixed up on this whole thing. John chapter 14. Go to John chapter 14. We'll come back here to John chapter 6 in a few minutes. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 26. John 14, verse 15 through 26. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Jesus is speaking as the Holy Spirit in the passage. He's talking about the Father, talking about himself, the Son, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send a Comforter, then he says, I will come to you. Why? Because that's God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's one being. Three parts of one being, not three separate persons. Don't believe that. It's a lie. Verse 19, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, Not Iscariot, 
In other words, the other disciple named Judas. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said, answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So there he plainly says about the Comforter. Verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another Comforter. Verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Okay? Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. They're not three separate persons, okay? One being, and Jesus can speak as the Father, and he can speak as the Holy Spirit because it's one God, one person, okay? So important to get that. But again, you see the whole thing there. How is Jesus in fellowship with the Father? What's he, as I live by the Father, you're supposed to live the same way by me. What's he talking about? He's talking about eating the flesh and the blood. Flesh, Old Testament, blood, New Testament. The water, the Old Testament. The blood, the New Testament. The light of God's Word. You see what I'm saying? John chapter 6. We'll go back there again. Well, I don't know. I think I can be a Christian and not you know, believe the King James Bible. <laughs> Man. These people. Some really lost, wicked people out there. I'll tell you what. John chapter 6, verse 59 through 63. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto you, Doth this offend you? We'll get back to that one for sure. What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Well, no, you just said the flesh and the blood. What are you talking about? The flesh profits nothing? Profiteth nothing? What are you talking about? It's the spirit that quickeneth. You see? The fellowship, what Jesus is talking about, eating my flesh and drinking my blood. He's talking about the water, the blood, the spirit, the three that bear witness on earth. He's talking about his word. You see? The flesh and the blood. It's right there. The bread that came down from heaven. The manna that you're supposed to eat this and drink this. and That's what he's talking about. The flesh profiteth nothing. You're not getting it. You're offended because you think I'm talking about me coming over and biting me and drinking my blood. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something spiritual here. You say, but it's not the word, Brian. What are you talking about? Let's keep reading. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Right there you go. John 6, 63. I'm a Christian, but I reject the word of God. No, you're not. You're not. Just that simple. A lot of uh, Jesus' disciples were there because they saw that he was healing people and they saw all these miracles and everything else. And Jesus says, uh, I'm going to put you to the real test here. I'm going to prove you. We'll see how real you are with me okay do you believe my words are you willing to live by my words i'm going to separate my disciples from the lost people out there why through my word or i should say how through my word why because god doesn't want a bunch of false people that are out there i mean talk about misrepresenting god i'm a disciple of jesus christ well, what's your standard my own thoughts and my own feelings no, it's not how it works. God wants us to represent His Word. This is our standard. This is what we give to the lost world. I'm hungry. I need some help. Okay? I have some scripture here. Some bread. You're hungry? Some meat for you? I'll wash you with the water of the Word. Are you washed in the blood of the New Testament? You see? You see? 
This is no ordinary book, brethren. This isn't some book that you can just look at and just, yeah, whatever. It doesn't really matter. You can believe it. You don't have to believe it. You can choose, pick, choose. You can prefer whatever Bible. Oh, no. Oh, no. Very dangerous to go against this book. Let's read John 6, 63 again. I want to make another point here. John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Um, is this chapter about communion? The flesh and the blood? No. How do you know? Because the uh, flesh profiteth nothing. It's the words that the Lord is speaking. It isn't something that you're eating, physically eating and drinking physically. It's not what it's talking about. John chapter 6 has nothing to do with communion and certainly nothing to do with transubstantiation, the Eucharist and the Mass, whatever, you, all the little witchcraft language that they put together there. It, hasn't, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It's talking about the Word of God. Look at verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not. There are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that be believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Now Calvin would come out, and John Calvin would come out, and he would say, Well, see, that's the elect, that's the chosen of God, that God forces into salvation. That's not what it's talking about there. God certainly knows who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. But man has a free will. Did Jesus tell them, you, 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 you're coming over here, you're believing. And you guys over there, sorry, you're out of it. No. He gave them free will to make the decision on their own. Don't ever fall for Calvinism. Calvinism is a satanic heresy. I'll say that one more time. Calvinism is a satanic heresy. Don't ever fall for it. God does not force people to go to hell. That is nonsense. That contradicts so many scriptures. It's ridiculous. And God does not force men to be saved. That's nonsense. The Holy Spirit will come and he will present it to you, but it's up to you to accept or reject. And you know what? The Holy Spirit of God will defend this book and will reveal things to you about this book through this study is one of the ways. And you can accept or reject it. It's up to you. Verse 65, And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father. Now look what happens in verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've seen that thing. Um, they go back to the world one of the types of the world in the Bible is Egypt. Uh, things were better back then. You know, I remember before I got into this whole cult, this uh, they'll try to blame it on me, you know, whatever. It's Brian's beliefs or whatever. No, it's what the Bible teaches. It's not my system or whatever else. I'm not the head of anything, any cult or whatever else. Oh, I, I got into that stuff for a while, you know, and all this sanctification. You can't do this and you can't do that. You know what? I get sick of it after a while. Oh, don't drink things that are bad for you and don't watch television. You can't dress this way and you shouldn't eat this and you shouldn't say that. You can't use profanity. You can't listen to this type of music and you can't go here and you can't do this. There's all these can't do's and very little can do's. So you know what? I got to the point where I realized I'm not even enjoying my salvation anymore. So, uh, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't want to live by the book anymore. I'm done with the book. I'm going back to the world again. I felt like a fool when I was doing that whole thing, trying to live by this Bible. I'm done with that. And back they go. And they walk no more with them. And I've seen it, I don't even know how many times in my years of ministry. And it's not my standards that they reject. It's the standards of Scripture. Right back to the world. And they get messed up. Bye-bye. If you're watching this right now and you say, you know what, I don't care what the King James Bible says. I don't care. Uh, it's not that important to me. I can live however I want to live. 
Um, you know, and, and I, I think I'm done. I'm unsubscribing and whatever else. Going back to the world, I'm not changing. There will never come a time that I will stand here in front of this camera and say, you know what, I've been studying this issue a little bit more and I finally have come to my senses. And I use the new versions now. You know, uh-uh. No, that will never happen. Never. I will tell you that right now. This book means too much to me. I've experienced it. I've seen its power. You'll never take it from me. John chapter 6, verse 67 through 69. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the Holy Eucharist. Is that what he says? Um, thou hast performed the first act of transubstantiation. We understand that the blood and the wine there, the, the, the bread and the blood, or, or no, the, the uh, bread and the wine. I'll get it yet. The bread and the wine is actually turned into your flesh and your blood, and we have to continually practice cannibalism in order to prove our salvation. Um, we understand that that's not what he says. Peter, you know, Peter, the first pope, Peter, what's he say? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words, words of eternal life. What's the passage about? Is it about communion? No. It's about the word of God. And Jesus is flatly, plainly saying, if you reject this, then you are rejecting me. Period. Period. Well, no, I want Jesus. I just don't want the Bible. Then you don't get it. Then you don't understand it. The Holy Spirit has not revealed it to you. Verse 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Are you sure of who Jesus is? How can you be if you don't have a Bible? Verse 70 through 71. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Um, there is a major danger of false brethren among the disciples of Jesus. And if you haven't figured that out yet, you must be very young in the faith. <laughs> um, there are a lot of devils that walk among us. They're drawn to the Word of God, and those who believe the Word of God are obsessed with it. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy 8 verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the, which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. There you go. <laughs> The bread is the word of God. Um, well, I reject it. I'm sorry. I just, you haven't convinced me or whatever. Well, then you're lost. <laughs> like I've been saying, I, I don't know how else to say it. It's such an amazing thing um, that we can actually hold a book in our hands that was made by the God of heaven. And Jesus says, if you uh, eat this bread and drink this, blood if this is part of you if it's a light in your life if you wash yourself with the water of the word and the blood of the new testament you have eternal life the lord will reveal these things to you um, that's why this whole study is for law for saved people lost people they're not going to get it they just won't understand um, they'll look at this and they'll say that's weird i don't get it i mean you know 
church history and the church proves that it's actually about communion and whatever else. Well, if it's about communion and if Jesus was actually saying that you're supposed to eat his flesh and drink his blood in the sense of his actual physical flesh and blood and you can turn wine into blood and whatever else, well, then, uh, um, then he's recommending cannibalism, which means he's false. So that's going to be it for this uh, number three in the series here. Um, third video in the series, I guess you could call it. And next we will be doing communion with God through the King Jesus Version. It will be the next in the series. And we're going to get into the thing of communion and what it's really all about, what's talking about there. And um, there's a lot of things that are very symbolic in Scripture. And the Lord does it that way. I mean, it was, I think one of the weirdest things when I started to read the Bible for myself and I realized Jesus says at one point, He says about when I speak to the multitudes, I don't speak to them I'm paraphrasing here a little bit. I don't speak to them plainly. I speak to them in parables. That seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand, you know, and whatever. Um, and I thought, why on earth would Jesus do that? Because that's his way. That's the way he does things. Now, that's the simplest answer I can give you. Um, I mean, you can get into a lot of the reasons why and go over scriptures and whatever else. But quite frankly, it doesn't matter about my opinions or my thoughts or my emotions concerning... The Lord says, no, I'm actually going to deceive certain people and some, some certain people, whatever else, they're, they're not worthy of hearing it. And um, these studies are for saved people. And, um, you know, you understand the importance of the Word of God in your life. And you aren't going to go very long without reading the Word of God before you start to really feel scared and, oh boy, I'm really starting to fall apart here. Um, if I go any length of time without being in the Word of God, it gets scary. I need that there, that fellowship all the time. So that is going to be it for part three. And we will be going on to part four here in the next study. Um, again, appreciate everybody's prayers out there. Uh, and I hope that this series has been a blessing to you so far. It was an amazing thing to go through these, you know, the studies and, and the Lord showed me all of this and, and I give all the glory to Him. Um, I have no idea if anybody ever preached this. I know I've heard some guys kind of hint at it and whatever else, but um, I didn't read any kind of commentary stuff on this or whatever else. Uh, it's just been the Lord revealing some things to me and it's, I've been praying about this for years. Um, and sometimes the Lord will he'll do that. You have to be put through some experiences and whatever else. And uh, I know that the older I get, the more I appreciate the Word of God. And um, like I said earlier, nobody's taking the King James Bible from me ever. I'll die with that book. So we will see you in part four. Uh, thank you very much for watching. And um, stay by the Bible, brethren.